Is there something that's kind of replicable? And then to what extent do you think, do you think across the region, there's other people paying attention and going, actually, maybe there's something that we can learn from this? My bullish case, and this is really just the, this is the best case scenario. If she, so long as she sticks to the bread and butter issues, labor, wages, um, the economic populism, the, the the protectionism uh, the protectionism and the nationalist bent that's traditional to the Mexican left, uh, I, I think that she should be successful, even if there is a, 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 a even if a kind of populist right surges out of nowhere. Right, you think because people people's material conditions really have improved drastically. <laughs> everyone, welcome back to BungaCast, the global politics podcast at the end of the end of history. I'm Alex Hokuli in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and today I'm joined by Juan Rojas, who's a columnist at Compact magazine covering Latin America. Um, he's also a contributor to American Affairs, and he was on previously, you may notice, uh, he was on previously talking about uh, El Salvador a couple of months back. Welcome back, Juan. Thanks for bringing me back on, Alex. So uh, Juan is joining us from Mexico City. Uh, Mexico has just elected its first woman president, Claudia Scheinbaum, who's a, a secular Jew. Um, and as a consequence, she thanked Jesus in her acceptance speech, though it's, uh, I think that's actually Jesus, which is her husband's name. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, Claudia Scheinbaum is going to be Mexico's new president. She's a well, she's a Jewish climate scientist from a communist background, which um, seems designed to trigger QAnon types. It's it's great. Um, but uh, Claudia intends to extend the legacy of her predecessor, AMLO, uh, who is actually anything but a stereotypical left liberal. Um, you can hear a lot more about him in our uh, recent episode, our election preview, which we did with Roger Lancaster that came out last week. I would encourage you to check it out because what we're going to do here today uh, is not cover the same ground at all that we covered with Roger. Um, so it's uh, kind of different themes which we're going to pick out, some about kind of political economy, about Mexican conservatism, um, and various other things besides. So we're going to get on to uh, all of that in just a second. Um, so just a quick announcement uh, for listeners who aren't all familiar with BungaCast, a new episode of ours comes out every Tuesday uh, with additional episodes on Thursdays and Fridays most weeks. Two episodes a month are free, such as this one. All the rest of our content, uh, to get it in full, you need to sign up to patreon.com slash BungaCast. On there, we have episodes with the three Bungabos, myself, George, and Phil, as well as our regular contributors, Alex Gurevich, Catherine Liu, Amber Lee Frost, and Lee Phillips, and episodes with writers and editors from Damage Magazine, with whom we're partnered, uh, which also means that if you subscribe to our Patreon, you also get a free subscription to Damage Magazine, uh, and there's always great stuff being published on there from a range of different perspectives. I highly encourage you to check it out. Um, so that's all uh, at patreon.com slash BungaCast. Just an announcement for those who our longtime subscribers, thank you for being with us. Um, but we'd like to let you know that the old tiers um, are being phased out. But if you'd like to upgrade for just two dollars more a month, you get double uh, of what we used to put out. So we're putting out four paid episodes a month, uh, which are only available there. So um, it'd be great if you joined us. Uh, what you may have missed over the past month, just to let you know, um, if you haven't been uh, following us that closely, we debated pro-Palestine protests. We uh, in the reading club, uh, our exclusive reading club, we discussed Isaac Deutscher's monumental biography of Joseph Stalin. We had the renowned music critic Simon Reynolds on talking to us about future music and about whether the contemporary high-tech music is all that futuristic. After all, we had Roger Lancaster, which I've already mentioned, on uh, to talk about Mexico, about populism, corruption, and class consciousness in Mexico. And we had two episodes on, on kind of, I guess, political films about Alex Garland's Civil War and Jonathan Glazer's 
zone of interest. Uh, and uh, so coming up in June, we've got lots of international stuff. We've got this episode on Mexico, which we're going to get into the meat of in just a second. Uh, but we are also uh, going to be talking to Achen Van Eyck, uh, one of the sharpest critics and analysts of Hindu nationalism, talking about elections in India, which are just wrapping up now. They've gone on for like six weeks, multi-phase, seven-phase elections, and we're going to be rounding up what's actually gone on there and what the prospects are for, um, well, for Modi to hold on for you know, through his term and and, and beyond. Uh, we are looking at South Korea and the fertility crisis there and increasing gender strife. Um, that will be out later this June. We're talking to Sam Chris about a whole range of issues about polarization, about politics, and about uh, Saudi Arabia and Saudi modernism um, and why Saudi presents a vision of modernity and modernism and why it might be actually rolling back on some of its ambitions. Um, in the Reading Club, we're talking about the structure of post-Soviet Russia, uh, and we are discussing also energy with Fred Stafford and the structure of American energy markets and why they're all so fucked up. Um, all that to come, and we'll also be dealing with your questions and comments in uh, our regular Alpha Bonus Bonus. Okay, that's enough previewing. Plenty of stuff to be excited about in June. We hope you'll join us for that. Um, and now I need to ask Juan, who's uh, sat patiently through these announcements. Um, I want to ask you, because you've been in Mexico City for the past week, uh, what the vibe's been there, what the election, has there been election fever, as people like to say, uh, and what's been the vibe once the announcement of the results came in? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, I guess I should say that um, I've only been in Mexico City. I wanted to leave uh, the city to get out to get out of the capital, but uh, unfortunately, time did not permit. The Mexico City is a bit. The opposition is a bit stronger here. Morena did win by ten points, but um, you're more liable to get uh, upper class, middle class perspectives that are a lot more critical of the government. Uh, that said, I, I mean, yeah, there was a lot of adulation, and I, I was also here for the uh, Claudia's uh, campaign closing the Sierra Campaña in the Zócalo, uh, and there's like a million, two million people. It, it was really quite something. I almost got crushed against the wall. Wow. Not, not quite. But <laughs> it, it was. It was good. Yeah. Well, I mean. Obviously, there's a. This is the continuation of government. It's not a new government coming in. Um, although the the president is changing, and there has been a an overwhelming victory in Congress and both in both lower and upper houses. So maybe run us through what the results look like and and what that means in terms of uh, legislative possibilities for the for the new Morena government. It's yeah. It's really just. Stunning. Uh, Claudia got between 58 and 61 percent of the vote. They're still counting. I think the latest count I saw had her at like 59. They apparently are going to come up four seats short in the Senate of a supermajority, but they will have two thirds control in um, the Chamber of Deputies. So, I mean, this is just huge. Of the nine governorships up for grabs, they won seven including wow. Yucatan, which is a traditional pan stronghold. I mean, really beat all expectations. The polls had her at around 50, some, at around 50%, some of, the, some of them. So it's really a remarkable victory, especially for a left-wing government, you know, I mean, in Latin America that right now kind of have been in the doldrums. No, absolutely. I mean, I'm trying to think of other examples where not only has... Uh, the sitting left-wing government won another term, but had such an overwhelming hegemony in 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 Congress in the legislature. Because that you know that you know you can think of examples like Lula's victories in Brazil and you yeah, know the, the winning PT four straight never, terms for the right. party, but they never had the sort of max ten percent in Congress. exactly. Yeah, it's a big deal too, and really, <laughs> all the financial media and a lot of uh, opposition media is going crazy right now because they essentially will have a supermajority. I mean, which is four seats they could be able to negotiate. Uh, Amlo had this; it is they were kind of campaign pledges in the beginning of the year, a list of constitutional amendments he wanted to pass. Pass one actually uh, that would allow workers to receive a hundred percent of um, what they used to earn in their pension uh, of their salaries as a pension um, and a lot of other eccentric ones too like uh, 
constitutional ban on vaping, <laughs> which we can <laughs> get into. It's really the real evil. Uh, exactly. But um, uh, the more controversial one is he wants Supreme Court justices to be directly elected and um, cut funding for the INE, the, the Electoral Institute, which uh, it, it was actually a bit uh, troubling at one point. They took an eternity to announce the uh, rapid results, which is unusual. I mean, even in the really contested 2006 election, they uh, got the uh, the uh, official results out pretty quickly. So um, uh, Claudia ended up giving her victory speech at like 1 a.m. And it was a very uh, short speech. So, um, but, but last thing, it's interesting, the congressional term here in Mexico, it starts one month before AMLO leaves office. And so this is why they're going crazy because, oh no, this tyrant, is he going, might be able to push through some of these reforms before he gets out. So you're going to hear a lot of democratic and backsliding in the, the media right, uh, right um, until he leaves office. Most of it, which has no foundation. I mean, they've, you know, they, they've won the support of the masses of Mexican people. Fairly um, and squarely. And... Yeah. Um, so, I mean, just we're going to finish I think this conversation talking in a regional context about the extent to which um, AMLO, Morena, Scheinbaum, maybe Buck kind of regional trends, what to what extent it represents a model, etc. Um, and I also place it in the context of what is probably largely speaking a kind of still a pretty conservative moment across Latin America. Um, so we're going to be talking about that towards the end. But just a little bit of that right now before we get into a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, one of the interesting things is that there hasn't been a that the kind of the right wing opposition is still is pretty socially liberal, socially progressive. Um, unlike in a lot of uh, Latin America, um, it tends to be, I guess, you know, you could characterize it as sort of progressive neoliberalism, right? Kind of right wing yeah. economics and and kind of you know, left liberal um, sociocultural policy um, to the extent that, you know, actually the contrast is that uh, AMLO has represented a, a kind of a slightly more traditional, let's say, if not conservative um, social policy. Is that a fair characterization? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's it's really strange, especially here in Mexico City, because there are progressives on both sides of the you know, let, let's say the alliances. I mean, really, it wasn't just um, Shane Baum and Galvez. Though they, they were the ones that got the most votes. There was also uh, the, um, you talked with Roger about this party, the uh, Movimiento Ciudadano, which broadly, and especially with the candidate that they picked for president, they got 10% of the vote. Pretty progressive overall. He was promising to decriminalize drugs, uh, wanted to keep all the social programs, expand them to, Basically, the election was all between different forms of progressives. Uh, Galvez, the thing is, she was heading the um, the main opposition alliance composed of the PAN, uh, PRI, and uh, AMLO's former party, the PRD, which on paper is left wing. So um, she actually on, on paper came from the PAN, which the, the PAN is, is traditionally conservative, has like a Catholic bent. There is a hard right sector of the party that uh, has met with Vox and is friendly with, uh, you know, kind of the populist right abroad, but they're just so debilitated. And you can really chalk it up to AMLO himself because he is just such an idiosyncratic, odd character. I mean, <laughs> I love to use the vaping example because... It's just so perfect. He uses a lot of moralistic, religious rhetoric, but it's something the normal Mexicans, especially outside of Mexico City, see as in keeping with their values. I mean, and it just drives the opposition insane <laughs> every single day, Monday through Friday. His mañaneras, it's like he'll just wake up in the morning and think, okay, what can I, oh, Look at these kids, these hooligans. What the hell is it that they're putting into their bodies? We need to stop that. I don't know what it is, but it can't be good. <laughs> so, right. so he kind of outflanks everyone, kind of is able to straddle the political spectrum, at least um, kind of 
the body of mainstream opinion while still retaining what is fundamentally a kind of central left um, policy. Yeah, no, platform. because his, his uh, as a his leftist agenda in a populist sense, it's all just for the people. So, raising the minimum wage, banning subcontracting. Uh, I mean, it's really stunning what they've done. They've raised wages by a total of thirty five percent during the six years he's been in office. This is just bread and butter stuff. People have just seen their lives improve. But uh, the the point I've made about why there's no uh, hard right here in Mexico, it's odd because the result ended up being that um, the election was between, yeah, different shades of progressives. Galvez, though, did have a platform on economics. She wanted to kind of reopen the energy sector to um, foreign companies. That was a reform that EPN did. Uh, AMLO's successor was disastrous. It led to oil production declining drastically with uh, Pemex and electricity prices actually going up. AMLO's had this effort to um, try to renationalize the sector by force in a way. But uh, uh, Galvez, yeah, campaigned in favor of uh, abortion rights and LGBT rights. All of the candidates did. This kind of a uh, populist right figure, Eduardo Verastegui, kind of a Bolsonaro type victor, uh, 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 figure, although what's funny is he's a former soap opera actor, tried to run for president, barely got one to two percent of the vote. It's uh, it's really unexplainable <laughs> it, <laughs> when you look at it on a regional level. That's interesting. I mean, it is very interesting. It's interesting why, yeah, Mexico is it, standing out. Now, um, I'd like to put Mexico in context, in historical context, particularly in political economic context. Um, so let's kind of rewind a bit and try to situate where Mexico is and, and how it got here over the past sort of 20 years, 30 years. So I think, uh, you know, at least in the Anglosphere, we hear a lot about the effect of NAFTA and free trade on the U.S., and particularly the effect on U.S. industrial workers who lost jobs, lost leverage over their employers when their factories moved south across the border. Um, but we probably hear less about what the effect was in Mexico, other than you know these maquilladoras, these, these kind of factories um, and assembly lines opening up in Mexico, and that would seem to be good for Mexico. Indeed, the way that it's, I think, presented in the U.S., particularly a lot of populist discourse, whether from the left and the right, this was all to the benefit of Mexicans um, and to the detriment of, of U.S. workers. And the story is a little bit more complicated than that. Um, you tell an interesting story about, you know, how this, uh, about, about these effects and the kind of um, political economic dynamics that have taken place uh, in Mexico since, since the mid-90s, um, in particular in a piece which is linked in the show notes, uh, your essay on, uh, on these matters in American affairs. Mm -hmm. Basically, and maybe I'm asking you to kind of uh, explain this out in, in more detail than, than I'm about to, but basically Mexican agriculture uh, went, was destroyed and went to the U.S., whereas U.S. manufacturing moved to Mexico, but also moved to China. So the picture is not a simple kind of zero-sum game. Uh, it's So anyway, tell us exactly what, what the effect of NAFTA was for, for Mexico. Where to begin? You know, I'll, I'll start here because I just uh, tweeted about this, actually. There's, there's this incredible graph from uh, InfoI of um, the inflation adjusted minimum wage here in Mexico. And, you know, Mexico in the 1970s was a very prosperous country. I mean, some years, 10% GDP growth. Uh, and you look at the minimum wage, it was extraordinarily high, actually higher now. Right now, it's only caught up to maybe two thirds of what it was then. And a lot of that was because of the oil boom. Then you know, uh, Mexico was and still is an important oil producing con uh, uh, country with the state oil firm Pemex, so it's one of the most important oil firms in the world, although it's in extremely indebted. But uh, you get to the 1980s and there's the Volcker shock, which causes this debt crisis. The country really goes into haywire economically the 90s or even worse it's just becomes decades of stagnation what they um figured was hey let's try to industrialize we are going to grow our manufacturing sector and nafta will help us do that well how will it help us do that <laughs> it is okay you sign a free trade agreement with the united states that allows you then 
you know, wages in Mexico were a lot lower. But the thing is, um, especially after the 1980s, uh, policymakers took the deliberate decision to suppress wages. They stopped raising the minimum wage and let it fall. And then it remained stagnant for 20 years between the 90s and up until 2018. That was a boon to NAFTA because the, the reasoning behind that is, hey, it's cheaper to manufacture in Mexico. All right, let's bring all this industry from the U.S. here. The downside, however, is that for um, so it was negative in that sense for um, the U.S. Uh, I, I forget how many jobs were lost, uh, maybe 600,000 or a million, something like that. But a similar amount of jobs in Mexico were lost in small agriculture. Peasants in the countryside could not compete with subsidized uh, U.S. agricultural products. It just became impossible and were completely run out of business. Uh, the state of Michoacán, for instance, was extremely negative and negatively uh, affected and uh, became a, one of the primary migratory states or emigratory states, I should say. Um, Consequently, millions of Mexicans went to the United States. You look at it and Mexican immigration began around the time they enacted NAFTA. This is, I mean, it's too convenient. It's, you can't chalk it up to anything else. The terrible thing then is that after 2000, China joined the, the WTO and this just destroyed Mexican manufacturing. Uh, so Mexico, the country was just hit with a one-two punch and now has been starting to benefit because of these trade tensions with China. Companies are now interested in moving back to Mexico. Uh, and, and unfortunately, a lot of it is actually Chinese products that would have gone to the U.S. directly. And now we're just uh, in Mexico. Mexico has become a third way country. Yeah. I mean, and so that kind of the story of which is the case very much across Latin America of deindustrialization. Um, Brazil has suffered greatly from that. Uh, various other countries have as well. Uh, Mexico seems to buck that trend, but again, it's assembly for U.S. manufacturers. It's not kind of Mexican-owned manufacturing. Um, and exactly. Yeah. I'll, I'll say two things on that. Uh, my diagnosis as to really Mexico's problem and what they could do to further their development, they need to develop their own firms. It, as you said, it's really just product assembly. Mexico is, a, is a, an assembly colony. All of these plants and the maquilas, it's for foreign companies. There is no Mexican Samsung or Mexican auto company, et cetera. Um, to be fair, after the initial shock in the 90s and after the early 2000s, uh, I would say that the maquilas, it's allowed the country's economy to be fairly stable. Growth has been incredibly low, like 1% to 2% for decades. Uh, but uh, it has been stable. It's been more impervious to external shocks, especially in uh, commodity prices like happened to Brazil. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, and I, the migration question is is very interesting once you put it into this context as well, because what would have happened otherwise if there hadn't been this outflow to the U.S. Mm -hmm. is probably, you know, the development of kind of far more urban um, Mexican economy, um, which which is what happened elsewhere. But of course, with Mexico, there was a case of and the opportunity to go to the U.S. So that's what that's what happened there. Um, and it acts as, a, you know, a kind of a release valve, I guess, for 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 Mexican politics um, or for not for Mexican politics, but for, for kind of Mexican society as a whole. Now, uh, I'm going to ask a question, which I, I, I really should ask this in every single episode we do, <laughs> or certainly every episode we do about uh, various countries' politics, uh, which is how is geopolitical competition, especially but not limited to the US and China, affecting Mexican economy and politics and maybe even society and culture? Um, now, maybe maybe there isn't a clear answer to that, or maybe you don't have a, a perspective on that at this stage. But I'm saying this because I'm going to keep asking this um, across a whole range of episodes, because I think it is um, the fundamental question of our times. Mexico is a really interesting foreign policy. Traditionally, it's always been part of the non-aligned movement. That's still the case, even under, well, uh, under AMLO's predecessors, it was more inclined towards the U.S., but on paper, they've always had that doctrine. 
uh, Amlo is, you know, a very combative uh, figure and he, he likes to be provocative. For instance, uh, there was this military parade where like the all of the countries that Mexico has relations with, uh, you know, paraded like their soldiers and the, the Russians were there and that freaked out a lot of people in Washington. What they said was, hey, well, you know, the U.S. troops were there, too, and so were X or Y countries, etc. But uh, at the same time, Amlo's actually said things like uh, he's not interested in de-dollarization. And this makes perfect sense. I mean, going back to NAFTA, the reality is that it's be- is since NAFTA, Mexico's economic fate, and you know, I mean, you could say geopolitical fate more broadly for far longer before, is inexorably linked to the United States. Um, it's, it's yeah, you can't really for Mexico. It doesn't make sense to, for them to say, "Oh yeah, we want to start using the the yuan more." It's just not viable. On the other hand, well, yeah, they, especially under a left-wing government, again, yeah, Amlo especially likes to be provocative. He's been sending a, a small amount of oil to Cuba. It's kind of a humanitarian gesture because of the island's crisis. This infuriates my neighbors in South Florida, but, but uh, <laughs> it, it's, uh, yeah. So, I mean, one of the curiosities of, of Amlo's period in power is his kind of bromance with Trump, uh, if that's not too strong a way to put it. Uh, They always have nice words to say about each other. Um, I particularly like Trump saying, you know, he's very loyal to me. Oh, but also I've been very loyal to him. (laughs) Making sure that it's not just a one-way street. Um, AMLO even called on Mexican-Americans not to, not well, or to vote for Trump's primary opponent, uh, to not vote for DeSantis. To not vote for DeSantis, yeah. Primary. So, um, we're going to talk about U.S. Mexican relations more broadly beyond these two figures, but um, I wanted to start there because I wanted to ask whether their, you know, romance, whether that was a coincidence of interest simply, or whether it's a personal relationship, but which doesn't go really uh, beyond that, or is there some kind of at least partial alignment on ideas and vision? No, there's a lot to say here. I, I think it's a bit of all of those things. You look at it. Well, first of all. This surprised a lot of people. Number one, because yeah, Amlo is uh, is left wing in a lot of ways, and he is. Whereas Trump is uh, is conservative, and or I mean, yeah, I guess you could debate that too. Or he puts on a facade, <laughs> but but, uh, but you think, oh, this shouldn't work, and and especially because Trump has this line against you know radical leftists, especially in Latin America, uh, Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela, and others. But on policy, even. But, but stylistically, rhetorically, on a personal basis, they have a, a lot of similarities. But on policy, they do as well. They both are very keen on energy sovereignty, um, oil, <laughs> uh, extraction. They're protectionists. They hate, they both despise NAFTA. Obrador had been campaigning for decades on renegotiating the the agreement in 2006 when he first ran for office. That was one of the big things that scared everyone. And they said, oh, no, 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 no. We can't possibly renegotiate our free trade agreement with the United States. Trump, since the 1980s, had been saying stuff like that. And so the, the this is purported. We don't know for sure. But supposedly from the moment they met and they met uh, early on after Onlo's victory before he had become president. Uh, as president-elect, he was party to the negotiations for the, to renegotiate NAFTA into the USMCA. And so someone from Peña Nieto's government said that, uh, yeah, uh, Trump saw in AMLO, it was like looking at a mirror and he called him Juan Trump. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's, uh, but yeah, and then beyond that, they both, despise the media they had this incredibly and this incredible animosity with the uh, the media and both of their and international media because the international outlets also hate on them it's uh it, it's interesting yeah it, i mean i guess the Obrador it, was one of the last leaders along with bolsonaro to recognize biden's victory in 2020 and um he sees in trump 
the the lawfare that's been waged against him, he sympathizes because he he sees himself in that. In two thousand and five, Vicente Fox tried to disqualify uh, Amlo over this bogus lawsuit against him while he was mayor of Mexico City. He created this huge media fur, uh, and um, yeah, he almost won the presidency. Then there, there was a lot of allegations of fraud. It was an incredibly close election. So Trump, there's a good quote of him. He, he uh, with Megyn Kelly, an interview with Megyn Kelly. He said, uh, "Yeah, Obergor, a nice guy. He said the same thing happened to him. They stole the election, something like that." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I guess they, they're both, you know, at least in in reference to the political systems and the way that things normally align, kind of heterodox figures. Uh, so I guess there's a kind of mutual understanding there, at least. I wonder how that will play out with Scheinbaum, assuming that Trump gets reelected. Mm. Uh, Scheinbaum is a far more, I mean, at least on paper, seems to be a far more orthodox figure in terms of, as I say, you Absolutely. know, kind of climate scientist from the kind of professional classes, um, has a more kind of traditionally like left wing communist background. I think. It, cut her, you know, got her political chops through the student movement, right, I think as well. So I think it's just mm-hmm. something which is a little bit more, um, yeah, I guess more orthodox in, in in considering, you know, the kind of political spectrum today. Yeah, let's see. So she was never a communist. Her father was a registered member of the Mexican Communist Party during the 1960s. Uh, and they were active in protests during the dirty war. The military here in Mexico killed hundreds of people. The the, the infamous Tlatelolco massacre in 68, something like 400 students were gunned down by the military. Uh, Shanebaum says that her earliest mes- memories are visiting her parents in jail. Right. So, so uh, yeah, she has a long history in um uh, leftist politics. I would say that, that, you know, that was such a long time ago. I, I don't think she's, yeah, she's necessarily a Marxist, but um, she followed in her, and her parents were scientists like her, uh, yeah, physicists, also something like that. She, uh, she first studied physics and then like energy engineering. Um, so she, uh, yeah, went into academia, but was active with student movements she uh, joined the PRD, uh, Anlo's former party, in the early 1990s as part of its youth wing. And she very consistently, yeah, since the 80s, 90s, has been a huge opponent, opponent for instance, of privatizing Pemex, Salinas's neoliberal reforms. It's something she refers to to this day. So, uh, and, and uh, we can talk about this also, the successor curse in Latin America. I don't think that she should engage, she'll she'll engage in like a full 180, uh, like a Lenin Moreno in in Ecuador, who uh, listeners don't know, Rafael Correa, popular leftist president, left office and his handpicked successor, stabbed him in the back, not just politically, but just went over to the opposition and governed as a right winger. I don't think that that would happen. And and so what troubles a lot of people is... uh, uh, is um, either the, the Brazilian case, what happened with uh, Juma Rousseff, and uh, who knows? We'll really have to see what happens when she governs, when she's president. But in terms of relations with the U.S., there's some, she's so, shown some signs of pragmatism, or at least people on her team have. This is only one thing, but I think it is important. Uh, Ramon de la Fuente, who uh, I think was Mexico's UN ambassador, he's seen as a likely um, foreign minister pick for Shane Baum, openly criticized U.S. asylum policy. She's said, she and both him have said that they're interested in cooperating with the U.S. on immigration. Uh, and so de la Fuente said, hey, like, guys, you just let anyone apply for asylum as soon as they enter the country as soon as the, i think his quote is like it's the the second someone touches ground in the u.s they're eligible for asylum this is obviously an incentive for people to go to the u.s so that that i think is uh is hard
How, how do the politics of migration play out in Mexico? Because Mexico is not just a country of origin, it's also a, tra a transit country for a lot of migrants mm -hmm. from Central America. Uh, AMLO was um, happy to, it seems, or certainly um, at least acceded to demands to halt that flow as much as possible. Uh, the military played a, a, a role in, in trying to stop the flow of migrants from the rest of Central, from further south in Central America through Mexico to the U.S., um, how what are the how do the politics play out? I don't really have a sense. And what are the constituencies in Mexico around migration? If there if there is, what does the debate around it look like? Yeah, that's a, it's a really complicated, interesting issue. Obrador and I, I forgot to mention that. Yeah, Obrador and Trump they uh, they they got along also. Because they're both transactional figures, and so essentially the deal that they came to, Trump agreed. Hey, look. We will like not criticize anything having to do with how you govern, uh, your security policies, etc. We will respect your sovereignty, whatever, in exchange, uh, and and also um, we will respect your energy priorities, uh, b because AMLO had had this push to uh, essentially renegotiate, re renationalize the energy sector, buying up. Uh, private uh, enterprises that had entered the country under EPN. Uh, and in exchange, Mexico would agree to clamp down on immigration, chiefly in its southern border. And so in 2019, uh, Obrador created the um, National Guard and sent thousands of troops to the border with Guatemala to repel migrants. Since then, uh, you know, things obviously changed with Biden uh, Etc. And uh, r remind me again. Sorry, the, the there was like a second part of your question. Well, I mean, how? Um... Oh, how, how, the, how the politics, right? Yeah, play out here. It's it's hard because you have to think. I, I said this in another podcast. What are the incentives for Mexico? You have a ton of migrants from foreign countries. Some of them from way far away from African countries, the Middle East, etc. China too that uh, get here and just traverse your country trying to get to the U.S., the easiest thing is to just let them pass through. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it costs money to deport people, pay soldiers to repel them, uh, bust them. You know, one thing that, that they're doing right now, actually, crossings have gone down a lot in 2024 uh, because of the Mexican government, when they started uh, increasing deportations and also taking migrants in the border with the U.S. and busting them back down to the border with Guatemala, it's kind of a half wow. measure. They'll eventually make their way back up. Uh, so, but um, uh, it, it, what, what I've said on that note is that if the U.S. wants greater enforcement for Mexico, they need to literally pay for it or do something for Mexico in exchange that they want. On the other hand, Mexico does have an interest actually in, in uh, stopping people from entering uh, through Guatemala. Why? There are a number of negative outcomes that come from having millions, I mean, yeah, something like 8 million, 6, 7 million uh, that have gone through Mexico to the U.S. in the past three, four years. Uh, a lot of the, you know, it takes time to get through Mexico. A lot of these are Venezuelan migrants. They'll work in Mexico for lower wages. That'll suppress uh, uh, wages for native workers. They'll have to house them. Uh, this is especially complicated with uh, Remain in Mexico because then you have to house, you, you keep all these migrants in the, it, Remain in Mexico it was suspended by Biden, but under Trump. Um, uh, and, and, and this is actually smart in a way. Uh, yeah, un under Trump, you'd have to stay in Mexico and apply for asylum here before going to the U.S. And actually, in, in a sense, that does give you an incentive to stop the migrants from coming in the first place, unfortunately, by force. Uh, but um, if you look at polls and something like 60 percent of Mexicans say they don't want, for instance, more Haitians or Venezuelan migrants from coming into mm -hmm. the country anti-immigration sentiment in Mexico, like uh, around Latin America, I wrote a, a piece about the um, about immigration policy between Colombia and Venezuela for the, the Telegraph, actually, that uh, talks about this, but in, in other countries as well. 
anti-immigration sent- sentiment has soared. Why? Because there is there is so much migration now through the region. Mexico, it, Mexico used to be one of the most restrictive countries in terms of um, uh, immigration, especially with Central America. The number of uh, foreign permanent residents from like Honduras was lower than those from Spain up until like 2020. So the 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 total of a permanent foreign population of non America there's a lot of Americans living here as well, but of Central Americans, Venezuelans, uh, Cubans here in Mexico has it's like over a million, uh, one point three million now, and that's led to a lot more anima- animosities towards those groups. Right. And this question has been, to a certain extent, militarized as well. And I just yeah. want to touch on this briefly. We, touched, we talked about it with, um, with, with Roger Lancaster in the kind of election preview episode. Um, how is that playing out? And will Scheinbaum continue the use of the military to fulfill certain policies? I mean, a lot of it is infrastructural development, which the military has been tasked with dealing with, but also, you know, policing the borders, policing in general, um, and indeed, perhaps uh, policing kind of uh, drug cartels as well. So um, the military plays a large role. Um, What is your view on this? What is your perspective? Uh, Is the and and kind of what do you what risk do you see with the use of the military? Yeah, it's this is a really complicated issue. I have no issue with them building things. And actually, a a, a friend of mine, an author, uh, works at a in a academic. He works at a university in, in Puebla. Uh, was explaining to me that hey, look, actually, before uh, Obrador's government, Mexico really hadn't built anything significant in decades. Uh, and uh, and um, Amlo's had these huge infrastructure projects. The the Tren Maya, the Interoceanic Train, uh, the Dos Bocas Refinery, a lot of them are way over budget, but that's kind of normal. Um, but they're really coming along. And a lot of that, and, and other pro- infrastructure throughout the country as well, a lot of that is because of the military. Their uh, budget is shot up, but the reality is that they, it was you really were only going to get a lot of these things built through, <laughs> through the use of the military. And you look at the history of the of the U.S. A lot of infrastructure was built by um, the U.S. Army Corps of uh, Civil Engineers. Uh, the the uh, panic, because the, the the critique against militarization comes exclusively, um, yeah, essentially exclusively from like centrist and center left uh, critics, uh, and, and they yeah for some reason I mean I mean I think it's yeah obviously more productive. For the military to be building things as opposed to just killing people. Right. <laughs> but at the same time, the military here in Mexico, it's it's essentially a parallel state, has been for a long time. Under the, the PRI, they had a, I mean, I mean, the party itself too had a, a symbiotic relationship with drug cartels. Yeah. And, um, and, and actually, yeah, they were traditionally very right wing. Uh, AMLO's actually been able to win them over. The uh, I think the, the Navy is still very right-wing, but the Army is very much in favor of um, Morena. A lot of that has to do with the fact that the average soldier gets paid the minimum wage, which has gone up in real terms 130%. So obviously they're going to like the president. But <clears throat> there's still a lot of abuses in the countryside, for instance, by soldiers, which is an of peasants, which is an odd thing for a leftist government, you'd think. I spoke actually with these kind of fringe Marxists near the Socalo, this party that's that's called like the National Front uh, towards the fight for socialism. And yeah, they explained to me how um, in like southern states, for instance, there's still people that are run out of their homes. Uh, a member of theirs was accused of killing a soldier in 2007 and um, he had been detained without cause and they finally charged him last year without evidence. So, uh, and I mean, yeah, this is a fringe group. I don't actually know the details, but uh, a lot of what they told, told me and I, I, I spoke with the, 
uh, like indigenous union as well mentioned that too. They said that uh, there, there's been less abuses than in recent years, but uh, at the same time, the government's banner was to rein in a, uh, and uh, bring to justice a lot of um, uh, abuses under previous period by the military. The most the horrible, sad, and actually, I, I think this is probably, other than security, uh, uh, AMLO's biggest failure, the uh, Ajotzinapa massacre, which if listeners know, 10 years ago in 2014, 43 students were disappeared, later found to have been killed, almost certainly by the military. There was a huge cover up and there was a commission set up under the current government is extremely bungled. And uh, in the end, they actually ended up uh, reaffirming the uh, or the original narrative that um, EPN's uh, like investigation into it uh, uh, found, which is just completely bogus. And the obvious reason for this, like I said, is because the military is a parallel state. They basically yeah. just vetoed this measure. Uh, and we're not. So, I mean, I think that'll in, be. In some, uh, I'm, I'm, about, I'm about to finish. So, long term, this could be very, very bad. Well, so, I mean, this is, this is a, a very interesting question, which we're not going to resolve now, but it's something to keep an eye on um, through the course of Scheinbaum's term, which is, yeah, what ha- is uh, the kind of military's role in infrastructural development? Is that a way of, you know, curbing uh, the kind of neoliberal anti-developmental tendencies? Yeah. Um, or does it... Uh, or does it set up problems for the future? Does it increase the military's role in political life? Does it set it up as, a, you know, a kind of parallel state, which it has been in, in many ways throughout um, kind of Mexican history, or indeed uh, bolsters the authority of, of the generals and feel that they might be um, have a greater role to play in politics? So I think I, there's a lot of concern there. I think it's quite an interesting uh, thing to to keep an eye on. Um, you've already mentioned security, so let's turn there. Um, sorry, sorry kind of, I'll say this. The answer yeah. is it's both. It's both of those things. Well, okay. Yeah, that, as, as it often is. Um, but on, on the question of security, because this also um, segues nicely um, from these questions, security doesn't seem to have played out politically as a key issue in this election, um, which maybe is one of the reasons why the f- field in this election was all broadly kind of fairly socially liberal, I guess. Um, There was no hard right um, law and order kind of Mm -hmm. candidate, which um, maybe if you're a listener elsewhere in the world, you think, well, that's that's kind of normal. Um, But in Latin America, that really... Not in Latin America, because Latin America, no matter where, whether the, the kind of hard right law and order forces are in the ascendancy or not, they're always present. Um, and they're present everywhere. They're present even in countries which maybe they haven't had such a, an important role like Argentina recently. Um, even Millet was able to um, lean into that to a certain extent. So um, Mexico, again, an example which really stands out from the rest of the regional context. Um, we Last time you were on, we were talking about El Salvador, uh, where uh, Bukele has locked up. He, he was just sworn country. into a, a second term, actually, right. as Shane Baum won. And, and Mexico, you know, it, it has a security situation, which is um, perhaps less chaotic than maybe some of the kind of TV makes it seem, because the levels of violence are very concentrated in certain states, in certain areas. It's not it's a huge country. country. I mean, yeah, the, the the caricature that people say, oh, Mexico, dangerous. I mean, yeah, sure. But it, 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 this is like, I mean, it, you, you can say that even about American cities. So some of U.S. cities are actually, there's a lot of U.S. Citizen, cities that are among like the top 10 most dangerous in the yeah. world in terms of homicides, St. Louis, Baltimore, uh, et cetera. But within those cities, there are even safe areas. It just depends. Yeah. And so Mexico's kind of, um, there's no single kind of national picture by any stretch of the imagination anyway. But the the backdrop is still one where there is a lot of criminal activity, high homicide rates, uh, and indeed kind of non-state organizations, which are, which really challenge the state's sovereignty over its territory, um, particularly the kind of drug cartels. So how was that playing out politically in, in Mexico? Was it a feature at all of the election? Yeah, no, no, it definitely was. And 
Galvez did camp. I mean, it, it wasn't like super like mano dura or anything like that, but she did uh, campaign on a, a tougher line that she would uh, take on the cartels head on, whatever. I mean, it, it's paradoxical because uh, Obrador ran on a, on a, he, he and actually been saying this for decades that he wanted to return the military to its barracks, that it, the problem was militarization that caused the outbreak and violence. People also, that this is left out in the headlines uh, before 2007, Mexico had a homicide rate equivalent to that of the U.S. at a national level. Sure, there's petty crime, et cetera, but uh, homicides were pretty low and had been going down for a long time, which, which is also strange considering that the cartels are, are have been around for a long time. But uh, Felipe Calderón, who won in 06, as soon as he became president, because uh, 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 presidents in um, Mexico are sworn in office in December of the, the year of the election. So uh, a few months into his term, he declared a, a war on drugs, a war on the cartels, this militarized assault on um, all of these drug trafficking organizations. It caused homicides to skyrocket into the levels that we see today and essentially have remained stagnant ever since. And that's a critique that uh, Morena and Mexican leftists uh, continue to make this. Hey, it's the, it was them that caused this. It's true. It, it, it's true. It's not false. The problem is that uh, as we discussed, uh, militarization has continued. And it's very incoherent because, okay, we're going to continue using the military. And I mean, in a way, this makes sense. Yeah, I mean, the cartels are heavily armed. But what, they're, what they've what they done is that the idea is that they'll be used as more of like to restore order, a kind of a peacekeeping role. So whenever there's an outbreak of violence, they'll just send a ton of troops to X area to try to quell the fighting. And th that can actually work to an extent, but so they're not targeting them directly uh, or going after you know, doing the kingpin strategy, which is also terrible because you'll just kill or extradite the head of this cartel. And then there will be infighting within the, the, the drug trafficking group or between others. So they'll, there will be mm. a power vacuum and it, it, it's a disaster. Uh, but the current policy also doesn't hasn't worked that great. Uh, it's also a PR nightmare because they the amount of a, a seizures of drugs has plummeted. So uh, it's something that really upsets people in the U.S. I mean, in the aggregate, unfortunately, that doesn't really make a difference either on the net flow of drugs. But you know, you want to be able to show results, especially to Washington. Um. There's so much that we, we've gone forever uh, about this, but I, I will say, according to government figures, and there's a whole fight over the data, you could do this in any country, honestly, but in Mexico, there's more scrutiny. Uh, uh, homicides, the government likes to credit this to its policy, have gone down 10%. They're still extremely high. But um, one thing that uh, people on both sides, critics and, uh, and proponents will point to, for instance, was the capture of, of uh, Ovidio Guzman and Chapo's uh, son uh, last year. I, I think in 2021, 2022, they tried to capture him. And this led to a nightmarish scenario in Culiacán, uh, Sinaloa. Uh, they let him go. And the reason they let him go is because in the the, the way they, the, that particular operation had gone, they were surrounded and it would have led to a bloodbath. Uh, and to their credit, when they then captured him in 2023, uh, they were able to do it in a less bloody way. So I guess it's humanitarian, sure. But on the other hand, they were humiliated by having to let him go. It's a lose-lose situation. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it, it's a tricky issue and one which um, this podcast needs to do a dedicated episode on it, um, which won't be now, but um, something for the something for the future. Um, so kind of reaching towards the end here, uh, there's obviously, um, you know, I want, first of all, to get your view on Scheinbaum's prospects and how you see that playing out. Because as we said, just to kind of uh, resume a little bit what we've said, you know, a huge electoral majority, a widespread support, um, the ability to not just pass laws, but potentially even pass constitutional amendments. Um, so a, really a lot on her plate and a lot to play with. Um, 
and a way of continuing and perhaps even radicalizing some of the progress that was made yeah. on Ramlo. It's good um, if you wanted to, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, there's obviously the, the, the important points about, you know, expanding oil production or increasing the minimum wage, et cetera. And that can all be um, extended. Uh, again, not a revolution, but um, a bit of progress in a regional and even global context in which there's very little of that. So that all looks interesting. But at the same time, some things which um, which might come undone for her. And we've already mentioned a couple of them. Um, there's the issue of migration. There's the, the security issue, perhaps um, most presently uh, and most concerning of all. So, I mean, how do you, how do you see it playing out? Uh, we, you've already mentioned the kind of successor syndrome. Um, perhaps it won't be a situation where she'll kind of do an about face and a 180 and turn uh, against all the accomplishments of her predecessor, but um, maybe things come undone. How do you see it playing out? This is redundant to say, but I, I, I've said it a ton of times. I'm both cautiously optimistic and cautiously skeptical. Why? I think that no matter what, she will sh she will govern in a more conventionally progressive way, and I think that that will inevitably lead to the rise of more of a hard right, either mm. in the midterms in 2027 or in 2030. And by let, let, let's spell it out. What is conventionally progressive, right? I mean, we've talked about how AMLO has been relatively heterodox, maybe a little bit more traditional on certain issues. Was um, you know didn't um, advance on on abortion rights, for example. In fact, said he would put it to a referendum. So, in a lot of these social questions, has uh, either said we'll just put it to a referendum or not really sought to advance in any way. He's made some enemies, even in kind of uh, culturally liberal social movements. Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. would Scheinbaum's approach be if it's more traditionally progressive? If you want to put it that way. She's, yeah, a champion of LGBT rights, uh, was on a UN panel for climate change. She, she was uh, AMLO's energy secretary while he was mayor of Mexico City. And um, all, I mean, she really has never gone against him on anything, but she'll be in charge now. And she said that she doesn't want to see Pemex go under. She wants to refinance its debt, but wants to do a lot more um, uh, to move towards an, an energy transition, which actually Mex Mexico has been one of the poorest performers on that mm -hmm. front. <laughs> Obrador really doesn't care that much, although th there's been some expansion. Yeah, uh, solar panels and whatever, renewable energy. The, the problem, though, is because he's a nationalist and has wanted to uh, take, re retake over the energy sector. A lot of the renewable energy is from private companies. And so they, they've been kicked out over the course of his uh, six years. And that's also accept, uh, uh, infuriated environmentalists and um, climate activists. Uh, the, the Maya train caused some en environmental problems with the cenotes and stuff like that. Uh, Shane Baum, though, yeah, she's been by his side, by his side so long. As mayor of Mexico City, uh, I, I cited a, a Bloomberg article that said that she prioritized development infrastructure projects in the city over the concerns of activists. So who knows? I've talked to a number of people that seem that, that say that yeah, they don't think that she'll go in the really like climate fundamentalist direction. But it will definitely be a greater priority of hers. And there's no way that she'll be able to maintain, just at least rhetorically, let alone on policy, uh, Obrador's heterodoxy on social issues. I mean, he, it, he's, just a, he's just a he's a bizarre figure. I mean, he's like promoted a record number of women to his, to his administration. And actually, uh, uh, yeah, like LGBT legislators as well. Um, but he's a traditionalist. He is not comfortable with LGBT issues. Uh, the Supreme Court actually uh, decriminalized abortion in 2021. And he just kind of, he didn't really say anything about it. Yeah, his position had always been he wanted to put it up to a referendum which up until recently would have meant that it would have failed, that, that uh, uh, abortion rights would have, would have failed, I should say. He says that, uh, and, and this is funny because it upsets conservatives, he, he says that, you know, he talks a lot about the family, quotes the Bible. Uh, that, that's not what upsets conservatives. Uh, what upsets conservatives in the U.S., I'm, I'm going to get to, but 
um, he says that because Mexicans have such strong families, that's why there's there's very little drug consumption in Mexico, whereas in the U.S. there's been a lot of disintegration in the family. And the, 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 you can find this on Twitter. There were a lot of right wingers that were just going berserk because, of, oh, it's because of all the people you've led into our country. You're, you're right, <laughs> but it's because of all the people you've led into our country. So he, yeah, he, and he drives just the media crazy with all of this stuff. I mean, the, the vaping example is, is a good case. Let, let, let me say one last thing on the vaping thing, actually. It's something that drives libertarians insane, especially because you think it's something so inane. But what's funny is that in a lot of ways, Obrador also has cut the state. It's more activist and protectionist, which infuriates them. But uh, and, and yeah, they, they don't like that he wants to yeah, ban vaping. But on the other hand, the number of employees and a number of key agencies has gone down drastically. Their salaries cut. Right. Uh, it, it used and to and be is Bum going to continue this, uh, this you know, re- so-called Republican austerity of trying to... She says cut- she wants to. We'll have to see. Is she, but her, I mean, her program is basically to just keep doing all the same things. The main difference, though, yeah, is on these progressive issues and uh, climate stuff. So, so what, one, la- one last question here, um, just to round this out. How much is the Mexican situation... Um, and the context in which Morena has been able to um, achieve s- such remarkable results, how much is that something which is just specific to the Mexican situation, to the course of its historical development that it reached a point in 2018 where people were ready for something um, more progressive, uh, where that was able to be um, institutionally, where you know, it, it was, that this party was able to be successful? Um, or is there something that's kind of replicable? Um, and then to what extent do you think, do you think across the region, there's other people paying attention going, actually, maybe there's something that we can learn from this? My bullish case, and this is really just the, this is the best case scenario from a progressive perspective, from a conventionally progressive perspective. I think she will govern as more of a conventional progressive. If she, so long as she sticks to the bread and butter issues, labor, wages, um, the economic populism, the, 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 protectionism, uh, the protectionism and the nationalist bent that's traditional to the Mexican left, uh, I, I think that she should be successful, even if there is a, 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 even if a kind of populist right surges out of nowhere. Right. You think. Because people, people's material conditions really have improved. Um, drastically and, and, and that might be something we we, should, we could finish off on but um uh yeah on the other hand yeah things could go bad i don't think that she can re- replicate at all uh her predecessor's charisma and, and heterodoxy and I, I think that would make her more successful because it, i mean yeah just think about it it's one thing just that uh you have someone that's looking out for you but people also feel as though the president shares their values. Mm. All right. Excellent stuff. Um, look forward to, uh, to, to Scheinbaum's uh, sextennial term yeah. um, and to see what she does with, uh, with the you know, congressional majorities that, that she has available to her. Um, and hopefully Mexico continues to be a, a sort of positive, relatively speaking, positive example in a region of which um, there seems to be very little of these days. Yeah. Juan, thanks so much. Thanks for having me on, Alex.